All right, welcome everyone. We're really excited to be all four of us today to celebrate the brand new release of Sun ID Reference by SonaWorks. I'm joined by an extraordinary panel today uh, made of Maria Elisa Ayerbe. Maria, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Loic? Great. Eric Bry? Bry or Bry? I didn't even Bry. ask you. Bry. Bry. So, Eric, okay, how are you doing? Nice to meet good. you. Nice to meet you as well, and thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you and great meeting you. And Warren Uart from LA. Warren, how are you? Oh, I'm from LA now. I love that. Yes. Well, I, suppose I, know. I am in LA, yes. You are in LA, <laughs> but you're not from LA. Where are you from? <laughs> Where in England? I'm from a village called Crookham Village in Hampshire. All in right. So the UK. Everybody watching this right now, it's time to Google map and see where Warren is from. <laughs> Actually, while we are at it and try to get to, I mean, I'm sure a lot of our viewers know some of you or uh, all of you. Uh, but what I really wanted to do here is we're going to talk about education and how education has changed from the traditional studio environment uh, into the online world. And all of you, you've done an amazing amount of master classes. You have your own program. But really, what I wanted to do as an introduction is ask you to share a bit with us and audience the process of how you got here as a professional engineer, what really was the path that you took, and was there a moment in your journey that had a significant impact on your career? And Maria, since you're wearing pink, red PJ, you go first. Thank you, Louis. Uh, I love my PJ, by the way. It's amazing. It's so soft. Um, so, yes. So, basically, I started out uh, my audio process when uh, I joined college back in 2003. I joined a program in... Universidad de Chile back in Santiago, Chile. It's a it's an audio engineering program. Um, I was there for about two and a half, three years, and then I decided that I wanted to actually have a career, a degree in music itself. So I went back to my hometown, Bogota, Colombia, and I joined a music program in there. Um, I did it's like a music conservatoire, but instead of um, having a, a going for an instrument, I actually majored in audio engineering as well. So it took me about seven and a half years to graduate from my undergraduate program. Um, then after that, I went to Middle Tennessee State University and I studied, uh, I have an MFA in recording arts and technologies uh, and I went there for three years. And uh, that's it. I, it's about 10 years of studying, but also in the meantime, I've had a parallel to everything. I've had a career both uh, as an audio engineer, professional in audio engineering and also music producer. And also as an audio educator myself, I've been teaching all along. And it, was there a point in this um, education process that you had a moment where like you learned something where like, this is really for me or. Oh, well, I, I knew that I wanted to do audio engineering since the get go. That's why I actually joined an audio engineering program right away. But I remember when I was sitting the first time I was sitting at, in a, like in a board, just running the board myself, I felt like whoa, I have the power. And all of these <laughs> buttons are actually just the same thing. And I know how to use that one thing. And that was it. <laughs> and, and I remember you showed me that power last year or two years ago in Miami in front of an SSL. I do. Oh yeah, I ran that. an SSL in front of a, a class. We did a drum uh, course, right? I remember. Yeah, I used like all the faders in the room. Yeah, that was super fun. Yeah. I know what every button means. Louis. Yeah, literally. <laughs> um, thank you so much. International background as well. I mean, Chile, you know, uh, Colombia, Colombia. the US. In incredible. Exactly. Incredible. Uh, Warren, what about you? Um, I, I came up as a musician. Um, so I was a guitar player, um, bass player, keyboard player, but and drummer. But that in that order, <laughs> meaning I'm a pretty averagely bad drummer. and. <laughs> I think it was out of necessity. Um, like most of us, you know, I just got into two cassette players, then four track cassette, cassette player, then ADATs. You remember ADATs in the early nineties? And, and, and that I remember, and I had a studio with some friends that had an MSR 24, which was a 24 track Tascam one inch machine. And 
but it was always sort of out of necessity. I didn't have any formal education. However, if we can go on to that kind of thing, I still believe in formal educations as well. And I believe in any form of education, quite frankly, anything you can get. But it was always the annoying guy in the band. I was the annoying guy in the band tapping the engineer or the producer on the shoulder going, why'd you do that? What, what's all that? <laughs> and I just had to know. And um, also, I, you know, I fell in love with music really young. Um, my father was a, a painter, an artist, and the music was just in the house 24 hours a day. It just was, it was all classical and jazz, but it was just music, music, music. And uh, so I grew up in a very kind of artistic household and um, I fell in love with the music. I mean, seven, eight, nine, I was collecting albums, you know. So it was never necessarily so much about being in the band. I got into a band because it was a way of getting into music, but I was always, I always joke. I fell in love with music sort of, pre-puberty it wasn't a case of like yeah i'm gonna get in a band and get some girls man i was already like locked in my bedroom at like 11 years old like checking the back of records reading people's names and all that kind of stuff so i don't know like all of us i'm sure all four of us here i was obsessed there you go that's pretty much all i should have said <laughs> <laughs> obsessed <laughs> uh thank you for sharing um and uh eric what about you well, I have a different journey uh, uh, coming up to like the uh, audio education. Uh, actually, when I graduated high school, I went straight to nursing school, you know, because like parents like, hey, you need proper education. This field is great. But, you know, my family is also like Warren is also um, uh, mu musical minded. It's always singing. My dad plays the guitar. And I was always in bands, too. But at the same time, I was going to school as a nursing and my my focus was more being in a band and trying to capture the sound. So like Warren, we bought uh, a four track cassette recorder, tried to record the drums in the basement and it never sounded as good as I wanted to hear like how they, they have in the radio. So I was like, there has to be something. So uh, we booked a studio and at, I think at that moment changed my whole uh, perspective. I was like, all right, mom, I don't want to do nursing anymore. And I didn't know at that time that Audio was a feasible field. I didn't know there's a career behind it. I thought it was just like, okay, you book a studio and, you know, if I, if I get big, being in a band, great. But I didn't know there was actually a field in audio. So um, when we decided to book a studio to record a band, I was more intrigued about how the guy was actually capturing the instruments than us playing. I was, I was like, oh, how did you do that? Like, Warren, you're like, how did you do that? Oh, why did you tweak that knob? Why? <laughs> I was, I was gonna say, so I was I was soaked in and since then you know, I, I, I researched on how to get into that field and I enrolled in school in five towns for a semester and then I went to Berkeley for another semester and then my parents were like hey you need to move back home uh, so I started uh, freelancing in different studios in Long Island and that's where I learned more of uh, the engineering part of it and it's where I fell in love and yeah uh, uh, obviously my parents weren't happy about dropping nursing school, but <laughs> now they understand. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I, I think my takeaway from this is one, there's not one path. There's really multiple paths. And, but the common thread among all of us is this sense of passion that is very strong. And I think you, you need it in a way to to fight the adversaries, you know, the adversity, sorry, uh, you know, it's not, it's not always easy. And if you don't have this fire in you, you, you might abandon very quickly. So I see that it's very common among the, the three of you. And thank you so much for sharing your stories because we're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about the information, but I think it's important to remind everybody what, how we, we got here today, um, at least the three of you. And really to switch to the topic uh, of the day, which is, you know, traditional um, learning environment uh, in studios to online. I did a quick search uh, um, on the topic and to see how much content is out there about audio engineering. And I searched for something very specific, which was how to mix vocals. And I found three, 33 million videos 
uh, YouTube, I think, return 32 million videos. That's all. That's all. <laughs> so my first question, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, Warren. Um, and of course, we might know why, but uh, if we don't, uh, um, make sure you go you you search for Warren. You are a producer, produce like a pro on YouTube, and you will see why I'm asking him first. But um, can you learn audio engineering on YouTube? And where do we start with 33 million videos of how to mix vocals? Where do I start? Wow, it's a wonderful question. Um, well, I one of my most successful videos is called, I think it's called Mixing Vocals or Mixing Vocals to Sit in a Mix or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. And it's, uh, it's like a million viewed video and it does really well. But what's interesting about it, just to sort of backward answer your point, is it's a way to mix vocals. It's not the way. And that's where I have really, what I've really come to learn over the last few years is that people are looking for a solution to a problem, realizing that this is a creative job. And the way I may demonstrate vocals, the way I mix vocals on that song might not work on the next song, certainly weren't, wouldn't work with a different artist. There are certain things, techniques that we can employ when it comes to mixing, but vocals in particular, seeing as you're talking about that, is one of the most, well, it's not one, it is the most idiosyncratic thing you can do. It is so unique from one human being to another, or else we'd all be singing into a, you know the same mic for the same compressor, same mic, pre, same everything, and have the same thing. So can YouTube and online education help? Absolutely. I mean, um, as long as you understand that it's just giving you, um, it's giving you one, one of the many 10 million different roadmaps to get from here to here. And I suppose your question is probably a bit more loaded than that. Like probably your, what everybody's wanting to know the answer is like, how do you cut through the crap to be honest? And that is difficult. It is very difficult because there's a lot of, um, the most successful videos I've watched tend to be the ones that, uh, what's the phrase? The, uh, I can't remember the, the phrase, but they, they, they sort of like they're popularist in, in, in uh, quality. So what they'll do is they'll give you the quick, easy solution. Oh, that must be the way. And that will get the 10 million views. You know, I have, without getting onto too much of a tangent, but the whole top-down mixing thing is something that's very popular to teach because it will get you a good result because you put multiband compression on your master bus and mix into it, it will even things out. And it will give you a pretty good mix, but you'll never get a great mix mixing like that. You want to solve all of the problems. However, a video like that, for instance, will be a hundred times more successful than a video that's giving you all of the real details. So it's a constant thing because, you know, ultimately YouTube is an entertainment platform. Therefore, it features videos that are the most entertaining. And unfortunately, the most educational things can sometimes be a little boring or at least as not as, woo, you know, clickbaity is and exciting so it's a difficult one you know if, for the people watching it's probably find somebody you know that you identify with that makes music that you like that um probably you know look them up go to all music go to one of those kind of discoggy things see if you can find something they've done at least to sort of like listen to what they've done or anything just find a way of attaching yourself to to that person and then sort of learn as much as you can. But it is a very, it is a bit of a minefield. I'd be, I'd be lying if I didn't say it. Cause I watch some of them and I'm like, okay, that worked. But you know, it, you've got a, you've got an overly similar, this is such a big question. I should probably pass it on because I could literally talk an hour on this. And we're going to come back to it. Don't yeah. worry. So yeah. keep, yeah. keep your I want to, I want to make sure. To I want yeah. to make sure you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we're going to come sure back. Make sure you click my videos. <laughs> yeah, go 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 and watch Maria. Go watch Maria's videos on yeah. on, on, on vocals. But, yeah. Eric, yeah. I want actually to extend uh, the conversation with you and let's say, what what should be the criteria to select the educational content on YouTube? Oh. I mean, it has to be. Uh, it has to have a standard of quality, uh, obviously, and um, it should have a factual content, not not just uh, like like. Just Warren said, um, it's not uh, 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 how to how to achieve certain things. 
but what 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 it's needed to be done to achieve it you know what i mean um uh it should be i think it should be diverse also in uh uh it should be diverse in respect of levels of difficulty because there's there's certain videos that um it's so hard to do for for beginners and 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 vice versa so i think uh that's very important and uh it should be also uh, it should also present a variety of points not just certain way of tweaking a, a snare or tweaking a drum there's other ways to do it um i mean those are the things i could think of uh of course uh, it should be something that um can utilize thinking skills and decision making skills too for for the viewers and um that's that's important i mean to continue just on that but it's clearly uh, to warren's point there was like i want to say the 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 cheap and dirty or fast you know fast you know do but there's would you don't necessarily explain what why mm -hmm. you apply some some settings or how what you do you don't really explain the why and others where it's more like okay, that's the are, word the why the, the why, why. How, and, and, yeah the why you do yeah. yeah and there are others are explaining more concept you know all right before i tell you why what compressor and what settings i put why i will use compress compression. not just how but why yeah, the why mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and 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 that's the type of content so uh, for all of you um you know would you say the information out there is reliable and mostly beneficial it's more like a different jungle and you need to know how to navigate through and i think warren you 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 start touching on this but i want everybody's input on this it's a what jungle. i'd say what i'd yeah. say is that sometimes and and i always encourage people because any information good or bad you it's it's about you it's like the fake news right it's like you have that content out. You have news and you have real news and you can decide whether you click on one or the other. It's up to you to make that choice. Uh, but it, when it comes down to making uh, aesthetic decisions, as Warren was saying, like, for example, there are instances like um, I mix a lot of reggaeton and then there are instances where I'm like, I wonder how the hell they managed to do this. And then I just look in the most dodgiest place of all on YouTube and then I find that there is a technique that engineers in Puerto Rico have been using forever that is absolutely stylistic of what the reggaeton has become. And it has nothing to do with the academia. And it would blow everyone's mind in, on AS or whatever when it comes down to like being super technical about it. But it works. So then I, dry, I, I watch that and I am outstanding by it, but I actually try it and then... I decide whether if I want to apply it or not. And then might as well one day I've, I've come to situations where I'm like literally mixing a string quartet and I need to do something. And I come up with this crazy, weird parallel uh, technique that I would only use for making reggaeton beats super snappy. And that turns out to give me what I need for a cello. It's up to, it's up to the people to make their minds on the content that they look for in the end. I think. Also, you have to look at the video if uh, the video has uh, has engaged and satisfied similar viewers as you. Um, so, if you go watch a video and you have you have the same interest and and uh, you you will see the comments that viewers are positive. I mean, that's the perfect start. So you read that, the comments. So while we're having this, people who watch this video, we need to encourage them to make a lot of comments what they've learned during this presentation. So. You know, YouTube's algorithm is going to push this video out and more people will see it and they will be educated on how to find mm -hmm. good content online and not how to avoid the pitchfall. That's what we need to do. So, guys, listen to Eric. Make comments below, okay? <laughs> um, no, but hey, listen. Have you, have you often or uh, once seen people giving bad advice on YouTube or online mixing courses? Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. Yeah. And this is the entertaining part of it. Um, or maybe yeah, it's yeah it's oh i don't it's um i i, I watch uh, especially during you know the pandemic that lots of people have gone into doing this and some incredibly talented people um and it's been absolutely beautiful um and then lots of people have got into it um and have really 
you can watch them sort of learn how to do it. So they're showing a technique and then maybe three months later, they're doing and mixing another song and they're now completely doing it differently because they're actually learning. So I watch, go to chat some channels and I can tell, Oh, this person's a year into mixing and they're already teaching, you know, I, I mean, you can, I, 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 isn't that true? Can't you all say that you see it all yeah. the time? I mean, yeah. Some people with, with teaching that, that are selling things, that they can't yet do themselves. I mean, that's just sort of an unfortunate thing. But that's it's YouTube. It's entertainment. It's mm. uh, it's a platform. It's um, you know, the biggest videos on YouTube aren't anything to do with what we do. They're all to do with you know, dances and I don't know, or whatever it might be. But not you know, we're we're, we're a very small piece of it. And it's a wonderful resource to go and find information. And I absolutely value it. But, um, you know, there's so much more to it. People will go and watch a video by somebody and they'll like that person and they'll just come back and watch videos by that person. And that's also a big part of, you know, of it's a community thing. And mm -hmm. that's okay as well. It's very difficult because I certainly don't want to feel like I'm passing in judgment but i am answering your question directly if, is there bad stuff up there yes there is yeah <laughs> M maria what are the most common mistakes you see from people learning from youtube videos i'd say that's a great question i'd say first there's one really common mistake that i've seen and and also because while i i teach obviously i encourage my students to go on and, and look for other sources because especially when when i remember when i was a student well it was a different world right it wasn't uh, youtube was started while i was halfway through my career um my degree so it it wasn't the same and uh and and we only had access to the amount of knowledge that my professors had and and the the amount of things that i could do on while i was in school and that was it nowadays is completely different and i do encourage my students to do that but then they come in the next day and they're like so i spent a thousand dollars on plugins and i'm like no that's not the point i mean it, you're you're talking about techniques you're not talking about a specific plugins yes they are plugins that will do specific things obviously but when you're learning compression it doesn't matter which compression you get I mean, if you can, if you can, and I always tell my students, uh, start, if you're using Pro Tools, start with the, with the plugins that come with Pro Tools. And I bet you, if you learn really good how to use those, then you can move on and purchase your next kit. And then you'll understand the basics and so forth. Same with Logic or Ableton. Those are great starting points. And so that is one thing. You don't need to purchase everything that you see on the videos just because they're there. And then, and then the other thing, as and, as Eric and, and Warren were saying, is that um, just because you saw something that worked on a video on YouTube, it doesn't mean that it will work for you, and it doesn't mean that it will work for every situation and every instance. So there's not a magic formula. There's not a magic trick. Um, and 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 I'd say that is something that for somebody who wants instant gratification, obviously it's impossible to handle and it's impossible to deal with. But but then again, managing frustration is, I believe, the number one skill that you need to have in order to become an audio engineer. Amen to that. Managing frustration. So that's when I when people get to this part of the video, I want to make sure you drop the comments what kind of frustration you usually experience when you try to mix or learn. Because um, I would personally look at comments and see what what we inspire. Um, so. Uh, let's let's flip the coin here a bit and are they instructors or youtube celebrities or creators or whatever we want to call it or other channels you'd like to check out and would we'll recommend to our audience uh I, where's well, warren warren where's where's he at <laughs> right here Three points at warren right, so. <laughs> oh, totally as, as you're watching warren go ahead and watch <laughs> then my go watch video <laughs> yeah maria has videos with us so go uh, tell me warren i mean i admit like i would go check out warren's videos it's like how did warren do that and i would oh, still like very kind. Day, i would still use it i mean warren is one of them and usually a lot of companies like pl uh, plug-in companies and gear companies usually have their own video of how to use it and how to use that specific plugin on the vocals, on the snare. I mean, those are more reliable sources. I usually go straight to those companies instead of searching for um, other videos. Uh, and 
obviously produce like a pro is like one of the uh, perfect example. But yeah, um, plugin companies, <laughs> plugin companies usually give like great, great uh, uh, tools and show you videos and how how to use it. We yeah, we try to like we try to as much as I can give out. If I'm doing something like I'll, I'll do a recording with one mic and I'll review it, and then I might do a quick mix of it, and then I'll give out the multi tracks because then what somebody can do is like copy what I'm doing. Sometimes they make it better, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's really difficult otherwise if somebody's like giving you, you know, I watch some of these like really expensive, you know, production um, videos and stuff like that. You know, I always joke about it with the camera like panning across the console slowly with like really crazy depth of field while somebody's going, I took the 10K and I see, I just, it's like a little, you know, like a little bit of air, you know, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't. It's, it's not going to help anybody. It's really difficult because I know that there's a place for that because mm -hmm. part of a learning experience is like Maria was saying, and me too. First time you sit on a console, you're like, oh, I've made it. I'm in front of a Neve. I'm in front of an SSL. It's a wonderful experience. And a part of the huge law of why we got into music was to be involved, you know, be behind the console, pick up the Les Paul, whatever it might be, whatever inspired us. So I do understand that. So there is definitely a place for the kind of sort of elitist kind of perception. But at the end of the day, you know, I got into this because I loved it. And I don't think, I don't know about anybody here, I don't think I was a natural talent, you know. I just felt like I had to work at it really hard. So I don't really sort of want to sort of keep shining all these kind of like halos because to me it's just like you take somebody like we first started talking about who's passionate and loves this and has a great work ethic i'm sure as heck believe that we could turn them into an amazing you know producer engineer or mixer it's really about coming into it with the right attitude and i think if anybody wants to take anything away from saying it's that that you can do it if you really apply yourself and there are these great tools out there um, but the number one thing is having that drive. But can, can I add something to, to Warren yeah. that also ties up to a common mistake um, that a lot of I see a lot of uh, young people do or when they're starting to mix is that they're watching all of these really fancy videos without really understanding that they don't have an SSL board in front of them. Mm -hmm. They don't have, they don't even own half of the plugins, but they don't even know half of the outboard gear. They don't even own the right acoustically designed place to do what what the people in front of them are doing and worst of all unfortunately they don't have the access to that quality material that these uh fancy other uh companies uh are portraying yep. so then at the end of the day it's like you try to replicate that at home and it's impossible to replicate it's impossible because you're never going to get there because you're not sitting you, you don't have those a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment right in front of you and you didn't have you to uh, performing for you. So um, I still wanted you to drop some names, um, but I want to continue on this. Uh, this because you know you, you you bring up the fact that there's a setup on the video, uh, and they have access to a high quality studio environment and equipment, but they are at home in their bedroom. Yeah, and and as we're, as, exactly. So what? So is this still? Does that mean that there's still a relevant place to go with formal education? Should I go Very to university? So. Of course. Totally. Yeah. Of course. It's totally worth it. At, at, and I believe at any stage of your career, and I, myself personally, I, I go to Pure Mix. I go to Mix with the Masters. I obviously go to produce like a pro. I go to all of these places. And when I am not mixing as instead of watching a movie sometimes i am watching a tutorial mm -hmm. and i am watching my favorite engineers my favorite producer talk about the nerdiest stuff possible because it's still food for my brain and i deeply encourage everyone to do so so when we prepare this uh this get together warren we wanted to talk about the formal settings the social settings of being at a university or at a formal education can, can we Bring this for everybody because I think that was important. No, I, to, yeah, yeah, I know. I agree because yeah, you know, when you when you we were preparing this, you, you asked me directly about you know, you're an online educator. You do believe in formal education, and I was like, absolutely, because I think the question any everybody watching this, the question you have to ask yourself if you're at a place where you're 
at a you know watershed moment, you're like, should I go back to school? Or maybe you're at a point where you're choosing whether to go to university and study, or should I go and get a job? Should I start producing on my own? All of these things, I would you just have to ask yourself, what's the learning environment that best suits you? We had a, a kid, I'm blanking on his name, Eric, the young guy, he was great, he was really good. And we offered him a job and he came back the next day and said he had called his parents back on the East Coast and said, I got offered a full-time job. And they said, well, if you want, you know, your uncle or whatever is teaching over at some really great university and they have a three-year degree course in music production and uh, we can get you in there on a special deal. And he came back and he, he's like, I'm thinking about doing it. And I said to him, I said, this is, it's an interesting place because I was offering him a job, which would be the same job he would get three years later. That's what's interesting. He would come to me and I was, it wouldn't be, he wouldn't get a, a higher level job with a three years degree because I still wanted that particular position filled. However, he was a guy that was really into the idea of schooling. He flourished on it. So for him, take away me and what my needs were, for him, he would have come out stronger, better educated. He enjoyed learning. He was a very social person, not in a negative way. He wasn't out drinking every night. I mean, he's just a social guy. He got on really well with everybody. And you could just tell that that was the thing. And so I said, you know what, go and do that and, you know, come back in three years or wherever you might end up. So it's all about the individual. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people like isolating. A lot, of, a lot of my friends that are coders, programmers, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're sitting in bedrooms going, tick, 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 making <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, not spending. I don't know what they do with their money. You know what I mean? It's just like, so there are plenty of people that can make a living sitting in their bedrooms, but, you know, College is a whole different experience. And I'll just be honest, I want to get to a point in my life where as I start getting older in this, I want to go back and do a degree in music music because, you know, I can read and write music and I understand all the theory and stuff, but there's still just a part of me that just wants to have a degree in music for something that I do and love. I'd love to go back and study the history of it more because I grew up on classical. I don't think there's... I don't think there's enough time in the world for what I want to do. I'd love to get on a plane and go to Austria for a few months and just study all about Mozart and then go to Germany and Beethoven. I mean, it's Italy and Puccini and Verdi. I mean, I love all of that stuff. So, you know, yeah. I'm a bit, of, a bit of a learning junkie. Without the traveling, that's what I did. I went to music school and I dug into Great. history and I really wanted it, really wanted it. And it, it was my path. Um, thanks for, for, uh, so there's still, and, and there's the social environment. That's also important. People might, Very important. might need that as well as the social settings and being interacting with other people. Yeah. Networking uh, with people, creating relationships yeah. that will last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So totally. let's talk about that because actually, do you think you can create relationships online or a distance or through online education or? I have oh. a I have a handful of people that are on our team that I've never met. Okay, so it's yep. possible. Yeah, totally. I've got mentors. Um, obviously, Marie and I have met several times at shows, but there's other mentors recently. Justin Cortelou is in Nashville. Did a really good course with us so with a wonderful um, country artist. This is as close as we've got via Zoom, and we wow. filmed a whole course together and all of that good stuff. There's quite a few mentors. I mean. Some of that's obviously to do with current circumstances because Nashville isn't that far away from us. But, um, you know, Christian Kohler, I'm working with him. He's a great German metal producer. We're build building a whole business together and we'll probably meet each other eventually, but we talk every day or every other day. Jamie Humphreys, who was uh, Lick Library, the main uh, guitar instructor there. I'm building a guitar academy with him. He lives in Sweden <clears throat> with his wife and baby. Amazing. Yeah, so, it's you can do business and network with people with never opens, meeting them. And he opens new opportunities. This is fascinating. Yep. Eric, um, so yes. just, I have a question for you and actually for everybody, but uh, you're going to start if you don't mind. Uh, because you touched base a bit earlier, you know, about the, the theory and the environment. We, we often hear people talking about critical listening skills, but mm -hmm. what uh, critical analytical skills? 
when someone promise um, to teach you everything in three months or promising the <laughs> ultimate course of mixing, how can you be sure you will get some real value out of it? That's something that's needed in real life. There's so, so many YouTubers. Oh, go ahead. And I'll so we're talking about the uh, analytical, uh, yes. critical listening. Uh, well, I think analytical uh, thinking, critical, critical listening, and I would also throw in the creative thinking. Okay. We all go in tandem. Um, I don't think you can, you could do one without, you know, um, obviously for critical listening, you, um, you need, uh, you need to learn how specific frequency, you know, how to cut off set of frequency and where that frequency resides, um, how a compressor reacts to certain things. I mean, those are important. And also being analytical is like stepping back and listening to it as a whole to see if the vibe is right, the feel is right, if you're actually achieving the direction of the song. And obviously the creative thinking where you could just add your own uh, ideas and how to manipulate certain effects. I think all those three are, is, is important, uh, not just one. Having those three is vital when it comes to uh, mixing. Anyone else wants to add anything? Warren? <laughs> I was trying not to jump. <laughs> you don't have to. I just want to make sure. No, you no, know. no. I, you, you can. You know me. Is it, the only thing I know about is music. So, you know, to ask me about other things, I'll be like, huh? Cricket? <laughs> we'll talk about cricket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's another topic. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a whole other. Yeah, but no, honestly, it's 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 the only thing I I, I really know and anything I, I, about. I, I think I want Ryan. Actually, I want to you if you can follow up on something very specific. And 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 Maria, you as well, because you said for seven years you study, and I think that's the aspect of the analytical skills, but also the fact that you know, can in three months can I get all the skills that I need to mix a record or work in a studio? And the answer is, if it's one on one, yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. All if right. it's one on one, and it was me with Maria for three months, we were working on, on something, absolutely. But how are you going to get that one on one experience with somebody working with them like that? And Maria yeah. said no. So I love this because I again. Well, we I mean, it, go back I'm making it. I'm making it. Yeah, I suppose what I'm doing is I'm making an assumption, Maria, that somebody is coming in with skills and they need honing and they need. You know, uh, I'm not a complete, a complete beginner. No way. No, not a complete beginner. So but if you're a hobbyist. Yeah. If you're totally. a hobbyist, you're making records and you just want to take it to the next level, sure. You know, come up with two hundred thousand dollars and send a check to Maria <laughs> and say, you know, I want you to own me for three months and she'll take you to a studio and teach you one on one. Absolutely. But the reality is is the problem with the sort of three month course idea is that there I was trying to make a point really that unless it's one on one, it's not gonna happen. And it can't be one on one. You can't pay somebody enough to do it. I mean that what would it what would it be? A hundred and fifty dollars an hour? Somebody would charge for that kind of experience. You know, you'd have to be a very wealthy person to get that. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot you can learn in three months. But if you're taking like a, a mid-level kind of home production person and want to turn them into somebody really quite incredible, no, it's I'll, just not yeah, possible. I'll touch up on that because like I was in school for a semester and uh, being in, 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 in learning it within that semester, you, I wasn't really, I didn't really absorb anything because there's so many people in class you'll be sitting in a different spot of the room and hearing something different from the guy sitting right next to the board. So it's, it's, it's a different experience. Like Warren said, I think one-on-one, -on -one, it, it might be doable for three months for somebody that has already experienced. But uh, for us a beginner, no. And yeah, like I think three months might not be enough for, for a whole class um, to literally learn. Plus, I think Maria can speak to this better than me, but who, who here knows what the heck they're doing anyway? You know what I mean? It's like, I'm still learning. So yeah. I think, the, you, you know, we might, you might, I think if you could hire Maria for three months, one-on-one, -on -one, you'd really quadruple your skill set. But at the end of the day, you're still going to walk out. You're still, you're still learning. There's still new things happening. Um, yeah. And, and from my personal experience, I actually got hired by a really wealthy person who had a PhD in biomechanics. And this person had developed this patent and he was, he set forever and he hired me and I would go to his place a couple, three times a week or so. And I gave him like lessons for like two or three hours. The payment was amazing. But then in the end it's like, I'm trying to teach this person how to record 
and 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 the guy could grab any recording book that I gave him and dig it like that because you're talking about a PhD on biomechanical engineering. I mean, coming up with ma ma mathematical concepts or <coughs> sorry, acoustical concepts is fast enough. But in those three months, how are you going to develop taste? <coughs> the person has never sure. been in a band, has never performed. He's just learning uh, guitar. So how are you going to grow into music in three months, even if you're the smartest person? It's really difficult. That's really, I, I, wow, we could talk about that. I could ask you a bunch of questions because I love that because there's also um, understanding how to make something sound current. What I mean by that is like everybody – you know that everybody wants something that sounds classy and classic and classy and timeless. But if you recorded something to sound exactly like it did in 1965, most people would say it sounds old fashioned, you know? Exactly. So you've got to understand like, how do you make it? How do you get both? I mean, that's where the beauty of somebody like Adele works so well. She makes you think of Motown and soul and all of this classic music. And it sounds so much like that. But if you a B it with a record of the time, it's got extended high end and low end and depth and width and all of this stuff. And it's, you know, it's, it's a modern sounding record, but the incredible producers and engineers and songwriters and performers and mixers involved and mastering engineers have managed to, convince you that you're listening to a nine mid 60s you know stack soul atlantic motown track but it's not it's completely modern and that is something that takes a lot more than just going boost 5k cut to vb here boost that turn the volume up that's the what maria is talking about there that's the taste that's the that's taking the some technical skills and then yeah and that's a lot training. of a quiet yeah e lot of ear quiet training noise. ear training not only for frequency but for music and also for taste for critical listening and all of that it takes more than five years because it is what it is it's just retraining your brain to understand different levels of understandings so maria and we don't have five years but what are the five <laughs> uh what what would be how do you do this here training for five years what, what what would be a good practice well there there's definitely and nowadays i remember in my day we would need to sit down in a classroom or if you were in a, in a studio environment working with someone then because you're tweaking eqs every day and you're having a client that going nope nope no nope, yes or a producer going that's not right that's not right yes that's right there you there goes your ear training. So that is the that is the studio format, right? You're going at it every day until one day you're like, do you like it? Yes, I do. And then there's the other way, which is how I did it. We had audio engineering classes where you would go and you would hear frequencies and you'd be like, I think that's 250. I think that's three, uh, 380. I think that's here and there. And then you would just memorize them and go and study them at home. And nowadays there are softwares. There are apps for your phone. There's uh, golden ears. There's a bunch of those that I can remember those uh, apps. And Sound you just, gym. There you mm -hmm. go. And, and then yeah, you I like just, that one. you download them and you, and you train and you practice every single day. Mm -hmm. And then also you learn how to play an instrument and you learn in your brain. You got to make that as an, for an engineer and producer, you got to make that connection. If I have a, what is a A4 and what is a four, what is 440 Hertz? What, how do I sound? How do I make 440 hertz sound? Like, can I do that? What is my voice doing that? And then, and then your brain needs to connect all of those uh, pieces of information. Um, and it's a practice that takes every single day. You go at it, you go at it until one day it clicks. Is this like for notes, like per having perfect pitch? You can have perfect pitch. And I, I know people that have developed perfect pitch yeah. by training every single day obsessively every single day uh and and it works really well and i also know people that have i have relative pitch so that works really well because it just i just go at it right away and i i'm i'm ballparking it i'm not going straight to the node but i'm ballparking it when i'm queuing that's more than enough yeah relative relative pitch is actually maybe what you can learn after if you're not born with it that's absolutely yeah, that's, that's right yeah but yeah. i know people that have actually trained themselves to have perfect pitch is yeah. really pretty it's incredible after 20 years or so yeah um well i, I have a follow-up question actually um so by now you all were uh, noticed that we're wearing pjs uh provided to us by uh 
uh, Sona Works, and and really, I think uh, it's uh, the spirit of how uh, Sona Works create those tools for. Um, <laughs> the, the, yes, um, I like it. This is my so the font, the fonts, PJs. The fonts. There you go. <laughs> I was about to say the Ari Cantona one. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, no, that's good. Um, when I don't talk about, but I'm not a Man United fan, so you can't oh, say that. Sorry about that. You have that. to edit that out. <laughs> I'm a Manchester we'll, we'll, United we'll, fan. We'll, we'll cut it out. We'll cut it out. No, uh, I'm, um, but yeah, so we're wearing PJs. It's of course uh, to represent the fact that a lot of people produce at home uh, in the bedroom. Uh, I think everybody got the analogy. But um, you know, Maria, the, the question I wanted to ask you. Um, who actually you work in a treated room um, and you all work in treated room, but what, what ideas would you give uh, audience to improve their listening environment? Oh, acoustical treatment one one whatever you can afford, start small. A lot of people, when I, when I get this question asked all the time and, and it's like, when I, when I tell people you need to start getting acoustic treatment, they're like, Oh my God, but I can afford that. And it's like, hold on. No, it's your bedroom. Nobody's telling you to, uh, tear, tear it all up and start from scratch. It's, it's not like that. You don't have to rebuild your walls, but by you purchase a couple of panels, then you purchase a couple of base traps. Then you cut, purchase something for your ceiling. And then you keep doing that. Every time you have 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, you keep investing and you keep treating your room. Um, also that is really important. Something to set your speakers on. So a uh, good set of stands. And if you're doing it on top of a, you have them, uh, on a on a on your desk, make sure you're decoupling them from your or like elevating them or supporting them in, on something that is going to um, just make a phys have a vis physical barrier between your speakers and your desk, so your desk is not resonating. And then make sure that whatever it's holding that, like it's it's able to do a little bit of um of of decoupling, right? Just so that those frequencies don't travel through the through through the surfaces. Um, what else? Obviously, I recommend Sonar Works for people that cannot afford professional acoustic treatment uh, and, and calibration for the speakers. But then again, just be sure that you're using it wisely so you understand your room and you have both the acoustical treatment and Sonar Works match perfectly together because you are still working on your room. You're treating the worst of your room with physical material and at the same time you're adding up the minor tweaking with sonar works so that works amazingly well get a carpet um uh, uh get some foam um put some uh curtains uh, or shades so you're not going to have bounce uh, off reflection points all of that study <laughs> and, and study um you, we talk about in the past, uh, actually for preparing, you know, you, you favor tools to flatten the reference, uh, I, I believe, but there's also tools out there that replicate spaces. Any, any thoughts on this? I, I like those. I haven't, I, um, I've used the Waves Abbey Road 3 and actually I, I went to Abbey Road when they released it and um, I sat in the room with a pair of Sony, you know, generic 7506s and listen to the music on the laptop through the app, you know, with my eyes closed, took the headphones off, played the music through the speakers. And I'm telling you, it sounded exactly like being in the room. I mean, it's the Abbey Road boffins with the Waves guys. And I know it took them two years to model it. And they did a really, really good job. Um, what, um, I've tried the VSX. Um, the uh, slate one i haven't got it yet they 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 sold out immediately but i did try it because my friend matt lang you, i'm sure you guys know matt he 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 has it and they've done something very smart i was talking to slate today about it what they've done is they've limited the amount of scope of the ambience of the room because one of the problems is not problems one of the realities is with this modeling even when it's amazingly well done which waves have done is it's still like learning another room. That's so exactly you, my point. <laughs> yeah. So if you bring in too much of the room, it actually makes it more confusing. What Stephen did very, very smartly, and it's kind of one of those things he does with all of his plugins, is he realized that quickly. 
So he just limits the amount of actual room ambience you can bring in. So every room sounds different, but not so dramatically different that people are freaking out because I couldn't understand initially what the problem that people were having. And then I realized, ah, I mean, they're essentially going into a completely different acoustically treated room like Abbey Road Studio 3, which sounds phenomenal, but it's so different to their listening environment. And most importantly, so different to their headphones. Mm -hmm. So what he's done is he's basically gone and made it. So it's like, oh, just added a slight bit of room to it. Oh, this room sounds like this. This room sounds like that. As opposed to what the Abbey Road one, which, which is fantastic, but it was like, whoa, it was like, oh my God, I'm in, a, I'm in this amazing control room. Yeah, amazing, but nothing like headphones. So really difficult for people. So, so I think that was a smart thing. And then also... Oh, my disc is out of space because you want us to send this video stuff? Or are you going to record it and edit it from here? We're filming separately as well. Do you want that or are you going to edit it from here, Loic? Uh, no, I don't need anything. Oh, okay, cool. That's fine. Um, <laughs> well, I, we, I was going to say, I wasn't even recording. I'm supposed who's, to... rec who's recording? <laughs> yeah, we've been, I've been recording. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, it's, reco it's recording here in the cloud. Oh, okay. sorry. You know, then no. you're going to have to edit this bit out. You were doing so well, and I just ruined it. So, <laughs> so everybody knows now that we're pre-recorded, <laughs> but we won't tell you the date, but it's soon to be March. <laughs> yeah. you'll, find a, you'll find a point to edit it. Nice, nice edit point. Um, and then, then I have my own experience of it, because there's an Indian company, uh, a wonderful bunch of guys called Embody, and they actually came to my studio and rang it out. So if you buy their version of it, you've got, got my studio. And I actually, this is before uh, the Slate one came out, I did the same thing. I told them I want 40% room. I said, if you give them 100% of my room, it sounds great, particularly with the, the big focales, which are just so Ooh. massive, they just fill up the room. But I said, in general, if you've got like the little monitors in the middle, no matter what you do, if you dial in too much room, people are just going to be like, huh? Huh? Because they're going from this to suddenly being thrown into a room they don't know. So so that's a very long synopsis, a long answer, but I really think that's the defining thing. It's a good piece of technology for giving you alternative environments, but it has to be controlled. Otherwise, it all it does is confuse. I think Plugin Labs came up with the uh, Dear VR monitor where you could actually tune down the room ambience mm -hmm. and ramp it up. Uh, yeah, they, they all have that, but unfortunately... When it has the hundred percent, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. If the hundred percent is what Slate's done, and, and what what other people are realizing now is just make the hundred percent forty. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of that. I just think it it just adds more confusion. If you really want to become a really great engineer, just build your room. Don't yeah. get any shortcuts. It's also about familiarity. If you're familiar with your own setup, your own room, yeah, you go somewhere else. It's it's totally different uh, listening environment. You hear something different. Uh, so I mix in different studios a lot, and every studio has a different sound. But I'm I'm more familiar with my room, and I'm more comfortable mixing in there because I know exactly what I'm getting, what I'm actually hearing. I mean, yeah, the rooms are treated in those studios, but I'm not familiar with the sound of it. Like so. It's well, just an adjustment, I guess. It might, it might be connected to the next question I wanted to ask all of you. But Warren, to continue on the fact that you, as you were giving the example of being in the Abbey Road studio and then putting, you know, being like, well, it sounds like the room, you know, it, it, is there still room? I mean, we, we recently uh, the mastering um, the mastering department at the at the Fame Capital Studios in Hollywood uh, kind of shut down. Everybody left, so this is a room that's closing. Uh, is there still room for room for room? Is there still room for traditional recording studios? Uh, what do you think would happen to those big spaces, those big control rooms? Um, I mean, I think it's natural selection, and I don't mean natural selection like some of the best studios have. Some of the best studios have closed, so I don't mean natural selection, i.e., the the good ones are left and the bad ones are gone. That's yeah. not my point at all. I just mean I think the density of the amount of studios is going to change. People are still all there's still going to be plenty of people that are going to want to get together in a room and record together. 
It's never going to go away. It might be mainly jazz. It might be classic rock. It might be folk. It might be classical. It, or it might be modern bands harking back, like we were talking about Adele earlier. It might be that kind of thing where they want to reproduce an orchestra with a band playing recording at the same time. It might be for a whole album, single track, whatever. Live drums. You want a good live room. It's what I mean by natural selection. It's just popular music that we most people consume isn't made like that anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that, that, well, that's not true. There are, mu there is music being paid. Just the percentage has shift. So yeah. where maybe, you know, when I, when I was in England in the like the late eighties and early nineties, where I first started getting into music, there was a massive melting pot of massive attack and Porter's head and all these bands that were sort of blending samples with recorded stuff. Well, now we've moved entirely into just the one side of it predominantly not entirely so there always will be a place because i certainly don't talk in absolutes but when i mean natural selection i just think unfortunately it's very hard for you know every city to have a hundred big rooms and and like you said it's unfortunately not that the best ones are left and the and the worst one there's been some ones that have gone under that are just mind-blowing how good they were and they've gone forever um you know and then there's other factors as well. You know, people get older, they want to retire, they close down studios, they sell it to property mm -hmm. developers, you know, yeah. middle of big cities. Yeah. But I, my short answer is yes, there'll always be a place for it. It's just there's less of them. Do you, do you see actually studios getting built up? Getting built? Oh, yeah, I think there's more studios being built than ever. That's because now what's happening is you've got us three and we all want to build rooms. <laughs> That's cool. That's it. Yeah, there's more studios. There's actually more studios. There's just less commercial studios, but mm -hmm. there's more good studios because now you've got like, like each one of us has probably got, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear. You know, we've got great gear. And so, no, there's, there's more. And, and now do we all have amazing drum rooms? No, I mean, I've got a really good studio. I've got an SSL, but my drum rooms just a, like a size of a little bedroom. You know, it's not, it's not a, massive room if i want to get the massive room i rent out the studio yeah. but in general i've got a room where i can do everything except for live drums you know and then there's the other thing well like if you really want to get a really good drum uh like a really good drum room then you call your drummer and that drummer has a really cool studio that he built himself where he can just deliver you the tracks like that same yeah. with the guitar player same with the bass player the trumpet player now they they all have their own studios and their own, the instrumentalists and performers nowadays have the, the, the capabilities of recording themselves easily with an iPad. It's just like they're connected to Logic or Ableton or whatever. And it's just more studios for everyone. Tommy Vacari did a film score entirely with uh, orchestras, orchestral elements recorded in individual home studios. Wow. And what he worked out is he had his assistant put together a mobile rig and they would deliver it to people and they yeah. would do like a little conference call and describe how to do it. And you had like this 75 year old world-class, you know, viola player, you know, and they're going, move the mic over here and just do that. And they're putting down this part. I mean, oh, where wow. there's a will, there's a way, it's you know, beautiful. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Eric, I'll have to check on that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, think this is very intriguing. I, I actually, last week I did a, a, a live set a, a live jam using Listento. And mm -hmm. the person, I was in San Francisco and the person was in Utah. And one would experience a delay, but it was minimum, but the other one, it was perfect. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. So uh, I've gonna, does, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've done sessions where, uh, especially during the pandemic, where everything's remote. Uh, they would just be recording their living room. The vocals would be recording in, the in their own kitchen. As long as they have a decent mic set up. Uh, it's it's really doable, and 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 I think uh, it's like every other industry is you know it it became it it's becoming because it had to become the norm. It's becoming very acceptable to do those remote se sessions. Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Uh, um, and it's incredible because you can open up now. Suddenly, you can have the seventy-five year old cello player play on your record wherever they are. It's yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so. We're going to switch gear a bit because uh, here we are. People are going to watch us on YouTube and YouTube is 15, 16 years old. I think it's from 2006. But there's a lot of noise in our industry right now among our peers about new platforms. And Eric, I wanted to ask you, uh, 
your thoughts on new trends and platforms that have been adopted by audio engineers such as TikTok, but also Clubhouse. And as we were talking about education, Ooh. you know, Clubhouse and networking and, you know, connecting with other uh, uh, peers, you know, uh, love your thoughts on this. And if you I, want, uh, yeah, yeah, I think every, uh, each platform is, I mean, these are great tools to have nowadays. Uh, we, like, like Maria pointed out earlier, uh, when I started, we didn't have these before. Uh, you know, I, I open books and try to find out what 3K is, you know. Um, but uh, yes, this is a great platform. I mean, honestly, um, I am not too, I don't have TikTok. Um, I actually try to prevent my daughter being in TikTok. <laughs> uh, but uh, artists have flourished in TikTok. Uh, it's a great tool to have. They have flourished, the, uh, especially being an artist. Um, uh, it, any platform you could you could uh, get into and, and and do well, why not? Um, Clubhouse, uh, I am not too familiar with it to be honest, but yeah. I've have colleagues where uh, you know they said, oh, it's like a virtual classroom where you could learn things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, either one on one or with a bunch of people. But honestly, I haven't actually got to check that out yet. Is it another uh, place we're going to have reliable and or, or unreliable information? Nah, there's I everything. No I've actually been listening on Clubhouse for like about two weeks or, or three weeks or so, and I've jumped in the weirdest conversations ever. It's like, there you go. <laughs> I, I jumped into a conversation where some lawyers will t were telling an artist that it was okay for them to give them to give the um, their manager a cut of their publishing, and I'm like, no. <laughs> Wow. Don't do that. And they were like, it's fine, the lawyers. And I'm like, no. So yeah. there's there's a little bit of everything. Um, but then and, again, and probably Maria, it's uh, let me ask you this. It's probably like all of these platforms in its infancy, it's going to be good. But you know, the, the reality is in two years' time, because they're not building they're not building a business model to only have like the cool hundred thousand artists oh. in there. Like it's got at the moment, they want to be Facebook. So they're going to start off like, yeah, this is like the man, you know, this is like a community, you know, blah, blah, blah. invite only make it super cool. But that Facebook started. Remember it was only students. Mm -hmm. But I'm very surprised as an example of clubhouse. Um, I joined recently. Um, and I won't say why, uh, but uh, well, out of curiosity, uh, basically, but I was, I, I noticed a, among all my social networks, all the people I know, uh, most of the people in audio and music were on Clubhouse. I was yeah, very, sure. very surprised. Because it has caught up. And then you know what? It's like there's a, there's everything. Like for, I was just getting a notification from Clubhouse. Like this and this and this people. Like, for example, this this at lunch, Piper Payne, Luca Predalesi, and a bunch of other mastering engineers um, we're having a conversation and I'm like, but it was like, I was already dealing with work and I was running a session stuff. And I'm like, oh, I can't stop in here, but I'm missing out on this. This is incredible. Like I want to listen to Luca and Piper and all of these really cool people talking about mastering. So it comes a point where like, when you join right about the time, you're going to find amazing conversations or just people like chilling and telling stories like, I've tuned in, for example, Gary Noble. He joins in all the time, and when you and, and when he starts talking about like his experiences recording Fuji's or Amy Winehouse, you're like, you're like this. You're like, talk to me more because I love this experience. So, as everything, I think it's great, but I do foresee uh, a, a not so in interesting territory in the future being that anybody can join Access. Uh, it will join and eventually how do you create that content it's going to be yeah. really difficult yeah and and to warren's part you know once it's the flood opens up and it becomes you know mm -hmm. it would be a lot of noise and it's going to be a new challenge for clubhouse and it would have to figure out how to better moderate and and so on um we have a few more questions but we we're getting we i think past the, the hour so i really wanted to wrap things up with a couple of you know um quick sun bites from all of you uh but i wanted to ask you you know you all continue to to learn i mean warren you said you said that earlier you know even though you have certain certain place you're in a certain place in your career but you're still learning but are there who's your favorite educator is there any recommended book that uh, you, about audio that you would love to mention anything you know 
I, I like I like artists and producer books that are more about the psychology than I do the technical stuff. Yeah. So I think I think the best book I've ever written on making music, the best two, are Phil Ramone's uh, Making Records, because he just talks mm-hmm. about the psychology of working with artists, mm-hmm. and it really helps you if you've worked with artists because you're like, oh, now I get what was going on. There's like these massive revelations when you read it. And then, of course, prepares you for things you may not have thought of. And it's just a beautiful read. Um, and then uh, I really uh, I, I really like artist biographies because then you get to understand the people you're recording. Um, the Miles Davis one that Paul Tingham wrote called Miles Beyond is absolutely amazing. And then the one that Miles did himself, which I'm blanking on the name, is wrote it with Quincy Troop. It might have just been called Miles Davis for those people watching, but it's Miles Davis Quincy Troop is. I think so. Just, yeah, it's just amazing. So you get, you don't have to be a Miles Davis fan. I am, but you don't have to be. It's just, it's a way to see into the mind of an artist. So as a producer's perspective. Otherwise, I'm, you know, there are a lot of really good recording books, um, but I wouldn't necessarily, not one is jumping out at me at the moment. And I feel like in your development, you can't get enough of an understanding about how to work with people. Mm-hmm. Let's just keep growing that, you know. Um, yeah. What, what about you, Eric or Mario? Any, any? Well, I always, I always keep this book that is right here. This is the, a uh, handbook for sound engineers, that big it. book right there. And it's like a Bible, every single terminology, every single concept, mm. every single piece of gear that exists mm. in the world, that book's got it. Also, uh, I recommend um, the uh, recording engineer uh, book written by Dave uh, Miles Hover is the best book. And it's gotten, it was the first one and it has been re-edited so many times. And the way Dave talks about things is just beautiful. And and I, I recommend it to all of my students and every single person that wants to understand our world because the way he approaches all the concepts is just in a very f- basic and simple, but yet global and sort of like um, time, like everything. It, it, it just, it's, it's, um, like he, he wrote it in the eighties and still valid. And then, and then he keeps re-editing it because that is one thing with uh, audio engineering books. If, if they don't get re-edited, then you're, you're going to open. It's like really old Pro Tools from early 2000s. His books keeps being re-edited. So you'll always find really interesting technologies in there. And I, I think those two are my two to go. Me personally, for fun, I read biographies about Beethoven, uh, Mozart, I, I, that's what I like to read. I read biographies, how people, what was going on through Beethoven's mind when he was writing all of his symphonies. Um, that's what I read for, for food for brain. I have the same, uh, book with Maria, but I I mostly read magazines more than books, especially like sound on sound magazines. I kind of like go to where, how the record was done or how it was mixed and what plugin was his engineer using to achieve those vocals. So tape up. Yeah. So, uh, I was, I'm more intrigued in those, like, you know, getting those details in, in a magazine. Um, Book-wise, same uh, sound and recording book. Uh, I just bought that, like, four weeks ago just to get a refresh, uh, just to get, like, you know, like, like I said, we're, we're learning as we go. So any type of information always is, like. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, you know. So I would like to uh, make two plugs personally uh, because we talk about books and biography and if you have read it or not. Uh, but Christine Jones' biography called Q, is, I read it long, long time ago and it's just incredible uh, to what you were saying, um, where I am about dealing with artists and, you know, he deal with he dealt with some big ones. But I want to do a plug and my plug for you, Warren, you have this program where you dissect one song that changed the world of music uh which also is fascinating to to watch and i really truly enjoy that as well so, oh thank you uh, I, I, re- not- I love doing those because because they're uh, one of the things i love doing about w- what we do is like i get to um I, I, I think how we all inha- we inhabit this world. We started off talking about it with one of the problems with, with YouTube. It's great. It's incredible. It's got amazing information. But it is a popularity site. 
And when I do those, sometimes it hits a nerve because it's, it's a song that I know a million people are going to go and love, you know, but then I get to do like, I just did Jerry Rafferty yeah. The production on that song is unbelievable. The musicianship is unbelievable. And then I did Kate Bush, Wuthering Heights musicianship. Unbelievable. She wrote it as a teenager. She mm -hmm. essentially produced everything from right from the get go. The producers and engineers are like, she's 18 years old. She's coming in here, just telling us what to do. She was there. She wrote man with a child in his eyes when she was 15. I think she oh. wrote it when she was 13 and recorded it when she was 15. Great. Um, and that, and the engineer on that was Jeff Emmerich, you know, so I get, I just love it because we get to talk about these things that, you, you know what I mean? It's like, we get to talk about these things that it's a balance between what people want to know and what they should know. You know, there's, there's not always what they want. You know, I, I'll give them what they want. If it happens to be what I humbly think they need. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, thank you for sharing a bit the behind the scene or, you know, how you approach this. Thank you, Lord. You're a very and, generous man. No, and, and, and you, you, I mean, what, what I love about, uh, you clearly admire the artist in the artistry behind it and the people behind it. And this, this come, come to life. I mean, uh, you're clearly a big fan of, I, I, one episode it was the sting one uh or the police one where you were talking about sting how it was an incredible uh lyricist you know and i never thought about it but i'm like oh my god yeah crazy all right last question but he was an english teacher he was uh, he, he was, was a 26 year old english teacher teaching kids english and playing jazz on the weekends and That's he was crazy. called sting wow. because he wore a yellow and black striped jumper sweater that was his nickname was sting because they say wow. he looked like a bee bumblebee <laughs> wow wow there you go it. all right my last, yeah Karen. no no i just say i like i like knowing that something we can all identify and go with oh i, I i'm that person as opposed yeah. to sort of i think that's my sort of mission i think I, I say this a lot but it's one of the one of the best things that happened to me is i grew up really poor in a very wealthy area so i got the nice wealthy accent but i grew up dirt poor so it's given me a little bit of a chip on my shoulders to say the least where I kind of like like to push against some of this kind of elitist kind of attitudes. I like to get to the heart and soul of like, you know, this person is like us. The only differentiator is they just got up and worked their ass off to get where they were. And, and, and that and we an can all like incredible talent and an incredible talent. Right. But they worked hard for yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah so, we, so it gives us all hope that we could be that if we work hard for it. Amen. So there is a one one more question I want to ask as a as a closing statement and really uh, try to inspire people to to take what they learned with us um, uh, uh, take that last advice is about mentorship. Um, do you have mentors? Have you had mentors? Should people ask me <laughs> last? <laughs> <laughs> Should we embrace this as a thing in the industry? You know? Absolutely. Oh, totally. Absolutely. I'm, yeah, and, I've had I've had mentors, and I am a mentor. So okay. yeah. I okay. highly encourage that because I think there's only so much that we can learn through books, through YouTube, through going to college and whatnot. But it, when it comes down to the nitty gritty or, or the like the daily things about our careers, there comes that moment where you want to just ask the person, how the hell did you do that? Mm -hmm. Or how do you manage this situation? Or like, I'm going with this thing with the client, which is something that I found at Clubhouse, actually, for example has become a little bit of a mentorship space mm. for up and coming artists and up and coming engineers and producers. And then there's like this uh, little uh, group of, um, I don't know, five to 10 more um, uh, veteran uh, mixers or producers or whatever. And then people just jump in and he'll like, Hey man, I've got this client and I already delivered them the files, but they don't want to pay me. What do I do? So it's like, we always, because that is not written. You, you can find all the techie stuff on the books, but you will never find the daily things of our job. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's really important and really invigorating to take mentors and then I'm sorry to take somebody to mentees and then just pass on because uh, none of us would be here if somebody hadn't taken us as a mentee before and, and, and helped us and guide us and, and assist us through difficult times or confusion or just random questions. So I think as a matter of honoring those people that helped us, then we can pass the baton and help someone else and then it can move forward. So uh, because we came out well, 
uh, and then whoever taught us did well. And that is something that is like honoring that beautiful tradition of just that, that just being a good person and, and being a role model in the industry, I think. Yeah. Good words. Good words. Um, so how do we find a mentor? Well, I'm going to say something. There was one time where I was like re starting out. Um, I forgot his last name, Ian from, um, the, the UK mastering engineer, he was the one, one of the first who started with a, with a blog and he came out with the dynamic range, uh, uh, day and all of these things. And I remember I, I loved what, how he talked about music and mixing and mastering and whatnot. And one day I went like, I'm just going to write to him and he wrote back. So start reaching out with people with social media. It's just really, it's just really simple to reach out to people. I, I read, I go through, uh, people that go through uh, produce like a pro videos and they just ask questions to Warren and then sometimes Warren gets back That's to true. them. That's yeah. true. All the time. All the time. Warren, All how do you time. do this? It's incredible. It's, I, I actually answered a couple of questions while we were talking. That's where you were <laughs> talking. <There> you go. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you drop questions below because Warren's going to check it out. I will. I will check it out. Definitely. Yeah. Especially, especially when I'm working with, with, with in new environments and stuff, I'll always go and answer because uh, it's all about cu cultivating people and, and helping them, mentoring them. Um, it's possible, you, you know, I honestly, I don't see why people don't. I think it, that's that's a part of the. It's an int intimidating Warren. You know. No, I don't see why people who don't do um, who do YouTube videos don't um, interact with their no. audience. I see, you know, the bit these the huge mega channels. They might answer one or two questions, especially if it's like, "Oh my God, you're amazing! You changed my life." Thanks, man. You know, they'll do a little bit of that. But I I I try to get in there and and help people because. You know, it's called it is called produce like a pro. It's not called Warren's whatever. You know, um, it's not my name. And the idea is for it to be community. And you know, what we're doing here is sharing our experience. You know, strength and hope with each other and helping each other grow together. And um, I think it just comes from a place where I don't see one of my biggest mentors, for instance, is Jack Douglas, and he doesn't have any highfalutin opinion of himself or his abilities whatsoever. And yet, you know, he recorded, you know, toys in the attic and rocks and double fantasy. He was one of the engineers on imagine, you know, I mean, his resume's insane. You know, he's recorded quite a few Beatles. I think he's recorded Paul John, obviously multiple times, just did some Ringo stuff. I mean, his resume is insane, but if you were to sit him down, he's just like, well, you know, just making it up as a go you know, has no ego whatsoever. So I learned more from being around him than I probably have from anybody else because he makes everybody in the room feel important. He never, he doesn't do favorites. And I've worked with producers when I was, not only, but when I was the engineer on projects and you watch the producers kind of hone in on the songwriter, you know, the lead singer, and they were just like, hey, man, oh, yeah, mm, yeah, I love what you're doing there. Because they knew that was the important person. And then I'm in a – and those guys that were usually dudes just didn't seem to have that great a career. And then you meet a guy like Jack, and he's he's just like, Tom, what do you think? And the bass player's drumming in and the other guitar player and the drummer and and, the, and everybody – he keeps the band feeling like a band, you know. Or he's hiring session players and he's – directing them subtly but he's getting great performances out of individual players rather than dictating you know and and so it's interesting because mentorship is like going back to me when, when you asked about going back to the, the book choices and maria and eric were saying you know about book choices it's like we're not always into the technical things because we realize a lot of those can be learned uh, through trial and error understanding how to relate to people how to get performances out of them you know that's that that's i've learned more from mentors and i would say that every mentor i've ever had i sort of wake up after the experience and go oh wow that was a mentor i don't really realize it at the mm -hmm. time yeah. <laughs> yeah true good good well on that note, we've been over the hour and I really, really, really appreciate all your time you, you took today uh, to answer my questions or our questions and and being very you know tra transparent and honest. This is something that I always appreciate with all of you. 
So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your availability. I appreciate that you responded to those questions. Thank you so much. And I guess on this, we can go to bed. We are ready for it. Uh, I'm going straight. <laughs> We're going straight for some enough. Some of us is a uh, bedtime. So I hope you all enjoy our chat today. Um, this is something we we're really excited to do. Um, um, we hope that you've learned. Uh, please make comments uh, in the comment section. Uh, we will try to answer or comment back. And hopefully you got a couple of tidbits that you will take uh, with you and apply it, be a book or uh, an advice or how to find good resources. And of course, you will learn it was not the intent, but Ryan has truly one of the, the most popular, not just the most popular, but thoughtful uh, channel. Maria has a lot of master classes and talks online which you can <laughs> just look for it and everybody seems to enjoy the straightness and the knowledge that you share maria and eric I, same thing for you uh, we can find oh, no. you. i don't have a i don't have a video channel yet but it uh, will come it will come maybe after that maybe people will request this so yeah. on I'm, this lear note, I'm learning from warren taking some <laughs> <shoes. laughs> all right guys thank you so much see you later Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thank you. Good Thank night, you. guys. Bye. Bye.